thank you. Right, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Old Truman Brewery, and thank you for coming along, and thank you for listening in online. My name is James Bohr. I'm the creative director of JPLD, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about art and light, or light and art. Uh, as a lighting designer, the subject of light and art, art and light, art that is light, or light that is art, are all great passions of mine, and to try and cover this in 15 minutes would be an impossible task. So therefore, this afternoon, I'm going to concentrate on discussing art that, by its nature, collaborates with lighting design through necessity and by intent. So uh, we won't look at the work of light artists as such. Um, instead, today, we're going to look at examples of art which stand alone in their own right, but have utilized light either to define and complete the piece or to give it a different and unexpected dimension. So first things first, who are JPLD? Well, we are an award-winning light design practice based in Hampshire, uh, founded by myself in 2006. We work on projects all across the globe with 70% of our project base and workload being overseas. We've enjoyed working on a complete spectrum of projects uh, covering all aspects of lighting design, schools, offices, private residential, hospitality churches, listed buildings, the list goes on, master plans, and of course, art projects, which is what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today. So, um, who on earth is this bloke? Well, I'm not a lost baker on his way to record another TV episode. However, I do also cook. I've been working in the lighting industry now for um, 20 plus years and playing with lights and lighting for a lot longer. However, more specifically, why am I stood here talking about art and light? Well, when I first started in lighting design with the wonderful Mary Rushton Beals at LDH, one of my very first projects was working with London Underground on their ambitious uh, art program, originally entitled Platform for Art, which is now known as Art on the Underground. Art on the Underground uh, program is a scheme developed by London Underground to bring art into the public realm and build on the close links that London Underground has always had with art and design. It can range from a large-scale commission taking over vast areas of stations to pocket tube map or little sort of mini cover commissions. Of all their sites, probably the most well-known is the disused platform at Gloucester Road. So in those early days, back at the turn of the millennium, the pieces and installations going into Gloucester Road were of a three-dimensional nature. Uh, these were often collections of art by art forum groups, or in some cases, individuals who had been commissioned. Despite having an understanding and appreciation of light and the effect it could have on their work, many artists were surprised by the dramatic changes we could bring about. We only had a basic spotlight at our disposal back then. However, um, by the application of different types of light, some cases different colours of lights, to the surface using focus beams, different beam angles, spreader lenses, softening filters, and even dichroic glass, we could really help define and establish the work and create stunning and sometimes alternative contexts. There are also some artists we work with where um, light and its integration with their work was an intended aspect of the piece. Uh, this is evident in the work of sculptor David Begbie whose figures and forms utilize light to create a secondary piece of art on their own. By illuminating the work with a focused beam of light onto the piece, the rendered shadow on the surface immediately behind, which in some respects can be more um, powerful than the actual sculpture itself. Um, rather annoyingly for us, David has now become a bit of an expert in lighting his own work, um, so uh, f fair play to him. But um, like David, though, there's a... Uh, number of other artists we work with whose understanding of light was such that they'd already considered it and in some cases integrated it to the point it was essential element in their work. This is even more paramount when working with glass artists where by the nature of the material um, they have to embrace light and how it integrates with their work. In some respects glass is intrinsically one of the hardest materials to light and this is what we're going to look at this afternoon focusing on one artist in particular. So Kirsty, um, who I've worked with on a number of projects now across the UK, she studied architectural glass and painting at Edinburgh College of Art and graduated in 1995 and moved to London and she worked with a range of consultants, galleries and artists and uh, 
she's begun to sort of develop her work in a very site-specific way. So uh, Kirsty and I were introduced about 10 years ago now and by, by a mutual friend of ours who's a documentary filmmaker. Uh, bizarrely, it wasn't until we actually started to look at our back catalogues, our portfolios, that we realised we'd actually worked together at Gloucester Road all those years ago and she was one of the artists uh, in, in residence, if you like. So here's a few examples of some of the early projects we've done. Um, these are site-specific screens, which are uh, very basic illumination, but um, quite powerful uh, in, the, in the effects, especially you know, once the darkness descends. Uh, we've got Bridlington Sea Change uh, across the top there, and the lower section are uh, Glasgow Fort. Uh, both these examples have linear wall grazing luminaires recessed in a special detail at the base. However, we're going to focus today on two more specific projects in a bit more detail. So, first up is Kirkstall Bridge Clock Tower. Kirkstall Bridge is a new retail destination uh, on the west of Leeds, occupying a peninsula formed by the River Air and Mill Race. The site lies within an area of important industrial heritage, with Kirkstall Forge, Abbey Mills and the remains of Kirkstall Abbey all close to the site. The clock tower at the heart of the development, which you can see up in the top uh, corner up there, is uh, created as a response to the industrial history of the area. So for the piece, Kirsty took inspiration from the 1930s clock tower, which was originally dominating the site, with the clock face and mechanism made by famous local clockmakers. Uh, Kirsty integrated all these elements into the um, piece, along with images of the industrial artefacts and processes specific to Kirkstall, which are featured in the screen printed glass cladding. You can see one of the early drawings there on the far side. Um, the clock tower itself is wrapped in an image of a woollen spool reflecting the blanket making and textile filling activities carried out nearby. So we were appointed by Kirsty to develop a subtle lighting scheme which emphasised the elements described in the narrative while helping to establish the piece against a visually busy backdrop. So the design and treatment of the glass was adapted in conjunction with our lighting design. Um, so it was, it was uh, modified to maximise the light transmission and diffusion as well as to conceal the luminaires and the controls. So we added areas of heavier sandblasting, screen printing or imagery to conceal the fittings and assist in the transmission of the light where required. There's a simple scheme uh, created using RGBW linear luminaires to achieve the internal lighting and the backlighting of the main glass with a dimmable LED sheet um, solution which we have uh, put a semi-opaque diffuser behind the clock face used to backlight the two clock faces. So there's one on either side. And the whole system is programmed and controlled by a basic sort of Pharos unit in the base with a daylight sensor on the top of the tower to monitor changes in ambient. <laughs> so you can ins clearly see on this one the aforementioned details by Kirsty um, and really give it the sense of place. Uh, the clock face lighting is actually tuned to the daylight ambient so to ensure it's comfortable to view at any time of day. In appreciation of the industrious energy of the site and the people who occupied it you can see the um, the, the, there's a slight colour change on it and the internal glowing illumination of the tower is subtly changed to loosely reflect natural daylight cycles and therefore human centric requirements to try and bring that human element into it. White light is warm in the morning as the, you know, to replicate the sun coming up and as it goes through the day it gradually becomes cooler and then it becomes warmer again at the end of the day to replicate the sun setting. Every hour there's a blue or a red colour shift um, to define the hour mark on the clock. So uh, next project we're going to look at is the glass tapestry at Oxford St John's. So this is a hidden corridor within the 17th century Canterbury Quadrangle at St John's College, Oxford. Uh, the glass artwork was commissioned as part of the library extension centre study um, by the architects Wright and Wright. So the piece itself is about 15, minute, uh, 15 metres long and it details the first 200 years of the college's history from 1555 to 1755 unfolding the story through texture and light. So the mathematically accurate series of abstract documents are placed along the timeline with each year represented by seven centimetres featuring key figures in the college's early history in addition to glass making techniques from the 16th to the 18th centuries 
alongside more contemporary techniques. There is actually an oculus you can see in the uh, image up there on the far corner, uh, sorry, the closest corner to me, two thirds of the way along this otherwise dark corridor, which is basically bringing daylight into the space. So that was a very important consideration in the lighting design. So as you can imagine, with a piece of this complexity, uh, a considerable number of mock-ups, lighting tests, experiments, calculations and assessments were required. Uh, we had uh, a number of maquettes were made because we had different glass techniques. Um, we had sand blasting, mouth blowing glass, all, all of which uh, react to light in completely different ways. We did a full assembly of the piece in the glass workshop and the bottom corner there we actually modified. There's 111 luminaires in this piece. Each one has got its own lens custom to its exact location. So we modified them all. Um, some are heavier frosted, some are um, not quite so much, some have none at all. To alter them in the way they uh, reacted with the glass. Uh, we had to, uh, it was a bit of a logistic, not a nightmare, challenge. Um, but we had to cite 111 individual Dali drivers and all the control equipment as well and make it look invisible. Um, so we did a number of lighting tests. And the bottom image there on the, in the far closest corner to me is a happy accident when Kirsty was walking into the college. We got this really amazing reflection off of one of the uh, panels as she went in. So the uh, piece itself, as I say, was built up from a number of layers and we decided we'd base the design of this and work on this principle using uh, multi-point lighting, so basically a theatrical approach. Um, there were many challenges. As I mentioned before, we had to, of course, integrate ven ven uh, ventilation into the frame um, to vent the, the fittings. Driver locations, so we had, as I mentioned before, we had 111 drivers. The luminaires had to be able to be directional, completely directional, and they also had to be discreet and anonymous, um, especially given the very close viewing angles, because people would literally just walk straight up to this thing. Uh, low heat output and reliable. Um, you know, this thing could not be opened on a regular basis to be maintained. We initially looked into fiber optics, however, this was not an option. Um, because of the cabinet dimensions, bend radiuses, and there was also no space to site uh, light engines either for the fibers. So um, what did we do? We called on our retail experience uh, of lighting jewelry cabinets, and we actually used uh, very small LED luminaires, which fill up with full articulation, and um, we could swap the lenses over, and as you saw earlier, we could actually modify them ourselves as well. Uh, we then designed a rebate detail to set the fitting back so it was even more discreet. And then finally, uh, to conceal it even further, we used theatrical breakup gobos painted the same colour as the internal trim of the cabinet um, to act as effectively like a honeycomb louver. But we didn't want anything as quite literal as a honeycomb louver. We didn't want to have that rhythm. So we wanted something a bit more abstract and a bit more random. So obviously we didn't arrive at uh, the end result by accident. Once we completed all the mock-ups, tests, and arrived at a solution, extensive computer modeling then took place to prove the method in the madness. Um, we looked at the effect of daylight from the oculus at different times of the day throughout the various season of the year. And uh, finally, as the, uh, as the piece had designed to cover the first 200 years, the client said they wanted it to last another 200 years. Um, it's best not to call our bluff as a light in practice, so we actually modelled the space um, and the effect that daylight would have in 200 years' time, working and allowing for the Earth's shift in orbit and the uh, sun's drop in azimuth. Um, so we could... We could uh, we could give them the answer on that one. Um, thankfully, the LED manufacturer wouldn't stand by a guarantee um, and back that up. And here's the end result. So 111 individual luminaires, all aimed, all dimmed at different levels, 120 breakup filters, because uh, we had a couple of blank areas that we wanted to um, leave without light. 
uh, all round for Faris controller. So, there's another image there of it. So finally, um, hot out of the oven, as they say. Here's one we made earlier, and uh, this has literally just been finally commissioned. So this is one, no art, well, you could argue we're, we're artists, but no artist was involved in the making of this. No artist was harmed in the making of this. Um, so not restricted to galleries or public re um, round projects, we often use art and lighting to add an extra feature element to a hospitality or retail space or to add a sense of place. Well, at Stockholm Airport, uh, we have done both by attempting to recreate the Aurora Borealis. The gigantic uh, lighting installation consists of a series of undulating four metre high chainmail curtains run through the entire 65 metre length of the shop. Uh, lighting is then set to run on a show with the overall programme designed to be 11 minutes long. As the northern lights, I don't, who are, um, some of you may well know this, but it's affected by a solar cycle that lasts approximately 11 years. So we've designed a show that lasts 11 minutes to represent the 11 years with a fade out to nothing at the very end to represent the northern lights dying and then 11 seconds of blackness to represent the 11 years when it's being reborn again. As we don't have 11 minutes, and I've probably only begun my time anyway, um, we've cut it down to a shorter uh, two minute show. So the full 11 minute show starts off with a small amount of lighting activity, starting off subtly before ramping up in ferocity and then slowing down, ramping up even more, slowing down, then gradually ramping up to a finale before fading out again. Uh, we wanted the replication of the Aurora as accurate to the shift and speed as possible, but random enough to look natural. In order to give this random feel, the tempo of the lighting changes and varies with some of the lighting runs intended to be very quick um, to build the drama while others are slower and more ethereal. We've all also purposely kept the palette of lighting colours fairly controlled so it looks more natural and not artificial and not like a lighting effect, uh, picking out only the most recognised colours and hues from the Aurora. Obviously from an artistic and installation perspective it creates that all important um, sense of place that we mentioned with Kirsty's work earlier on. Um, from a commercial aspect, uh, it's great because it creates a tourist attraction within a shop, which of course increases footfall uh, in the store, increases dwell time. Um, people actually just come to the store to see this and uh, makes them stay in the shop. Thank you very much.